Good afternoon. My name is Molly Martin, and I'm the director of New America Indianapolis. New America is a nonpartisan, nonprofit think tank based in DC, but I've lived in Indianapolis for almost 20 years, and I focus my work on the Midwest, the Rust Belt, the Upper South, and equity and economic opportunity. I'm so pleased today to be here with an excellent panel and with our leading partners at the Indianapolis Recorder, one of America's oldest and most respected Black newspapers based in Indianapolis. I know we have guests from a across the country today, so thank you as well for joining us. I'm going to do a brief introduction of our panel and a brief run through of how today will work before I hand it off to my co-moderator. Uh, our panel today features Imhotep Adisa, the Executive Director and Co-Founder of Kepra Institute, Vincent Ash, the Senior Project Manager at the Indianapolis Chamber, the Honorable Robin Shackelford from the Indiana House of Representatives representing the 98th District, Taylor Simpson, the Founder and CEO of the Halo app, and Larry Williams, the president and Indie Black, of the Indie Black Chamber of Commerce and the owner of a local security firm. I'll introduce my co-moderator in just a moment. New America and the Indianapolis Recorder decided to do this COVID and the Black Community series because we understand that it's important Black voices are amplified and included in solution design and response to this crisis. We also understand that the Black community in America is being impacted differently by COVID-19 than other communities are. When New America talks about race and economic equity and when we talk about the Black community, we keep a couple things in mind. Black voices are critical to our communities, their economic lives, their cultural lives, our individual lives. Black lives matter. Matter. Race and ethnicity are different. Black residents and the Black experience are not monolithic. And we say sometimes vulnerable populations. That vulnerability may be to systemic biases and again doesn't mean to imply that Black residents all have the same experience or resources. I do want to kick us off as we focus today's conversation on how Black businesses can weather the storm of COVID-19. We have a perfect co-moderator in Marshawn Wally, a civic entrepreneur and innovator and a columnist at the Indianapolis Recorder. I'm going to turn it over to Marshawn to talk a little bit and walk us into our first part of the session. A reminder to our guests though, because I've had a couple of questions, uh, unless you're a speaker, we can't see you, so you're okay if you're in your pajamas. Uh, Marshawn, I want to hand it off to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Molly. Thank you, Molly. And uh, it is very much a pleasure to be here and to be a part of this important conversation. Uh, part of what we're talking about is the story of Black business. The story of Black business is going to be about economic empowerment. It's going to be about Black entrepreneurs chasing their dreams. And sometimes it's also about family more than just being about B2B or business to business or business to consumer, black businesses are also cultural institutions. They make a community, they make a city. And I'm very proud to be a part of the Indianapolis Recorder, which is celebrating its 125th year of being in business. Um, part of the story of black business is also the story of disparity and overcoming. Uh, the city of Indianapolis conducted a disparity study really for the first time in about 20 years. And one of the studies that we, one of the, uh, one of the data points that we found uh, from the data period that they were looking at was that black owned firms received about 73 cents for every dollar that they might have expected to receive based on availability during a, a four year study time period. We also know that um, we're in Indianapolis, that there's a lot of construction firms and architecture firms, and they do well when we are building stadiums and public works projects. But when we're not, that's definitely a challenge. Um, there's also the question of, in most cities, minority versus black. How are we you know, disaggregating um, the idea of minority versus black businesses and really honing in on what the real story is of black businesses? Often we hear the story of about capacity and trying to get access to capital and how that's kind of a chicken versus the egg kind of a story. There's also the story about the general bias towards black businesses and sometimes black leaders within the community. Um, black businesses definitely have a story to tell. But what we're going to focus on today is a, just one piece of that story is black businesses as it pertains to COVID. And what we've put together here is really an ecosystem that's involved with uh, the black business community here uh, in Indianapolis. And today we're gonna hear from uh, individuals who run black businesses, uh, a B2B firm in the form of a security firm. We're gonna hear from a black st uh, startup 
that is uh, B2C or business to consumer. We're gonna hear from our Indie Black Chamber of Commerce. We're gonna hear from a black elected official who's a policymaker advocating for black businesses. We're gonna hear from a black social enterprise as well. Um, and, and we'll have an important conversation that I think really needs to happen. And so with that, we're gonna move into this conversation. And my first question is actually gonna to go to Larry Williams. Larry is uh, wearing two hats in this conversation. He is both a business owner and the leader of the Indie Black Chamber of Commerce. So Larry, tell us a little bit about your business first. Uh, you're, he's muted. Let's go ahead and unmute you. There we go, there we go, Larry. So go ahead and tell us a little bit about your business. Thank you, Marshawn. Um, me and my mother own a security company, uh, uniformed guards, ar armed guards, um, off-duty police officers. And so right now, uh, during this uh, pandemic, uh, half of our contracts have uh, closed down. But uh, so like some of the churches, uh, we do BMVs, um, event centers. So those have been shut down. Uh, but by the grace of God, half of them are still going. Uh, we still do um, Indigo. We have construction sites. Uh, we also have the Criminal Justice Center. Uh, we do Department of Family Services. So we're, we're still functioning and uh, going um, through this. Uh, that, well, that's good. So um, can you tell us about the Indie Black Chamber of Commerce? Why does it exist? What do you, and what are you hearing from other black businesses, particularly as it pertains to COVID-19? Sure. Uh, just like you said, um, the city did a disparity study. Well, in 2014, the state did a disparity study, and it showed that the black community in the whole state was doing 2% of available contracts, and there was no one advocating for black businesses. So me and my mother started the Black Chamber, and what we did was we, we got black business together and start advocating to make sure that we got these contracts that are set, set aside for us uh, because of our tax dollars. Okay, go ahead. And so here uh, we have over 250 members. And so our goal right now, we've been talking to them and um, some of them have been shut down. Uh, some of the restaurants have been doing well because people are coming and patronizing them and, and using uh, just the walk-up method and uh, the order method through DoorDash and things of that nature. Okay, that's, that's, that's important. And you, you raised the issue of advocacy. Um, that's been, I think, one of the successes that I've seen from the Indie Black Chamber, just observing from afar. Can you talk about some of your advocacy efforts and really how you've thought about success? Sure. Um, we've advocated with uh, the airport. They have been a great partner. Uh, we've gotten a lot of uh, members there. Uh, we've advocated for Eskenazi. We've got a lot of contracts through there. Um, so um, dealing with the bigger companies, making sure we get uh, people in there because, um, well, the capacity is a lot of things that, that they say that we can't handle. So we can get people in there. We try to walk them through and make sure that they can meet the capacity and everything they need to grow. So, so can you talk about that working with businesses and um, trying to build capacity? Is that one of the goals that you all have kind of created for yourself as a black chamber, particularly during this time? Uh, definitely. I mean, we, we have uh, three goals. Uh, the first goal is to, number one, uh, teach people how to run the back office of a business. Because you, you, can, you can build a chair, but uh, do you understand the back office? Do you know what license you need, cer uh, certification, insurance? All those back office things, we make sure we teach. And then once we get you on that point, then we go to uh, the bigger companies and advocate to make sure that we get you contracts. And while you have that contract, we walk you through to make sure you keep it and grow from there. So it sounds like um, the Black Chamber is really doing a lot of work to try to support Black businesses. Um, are you seeing, you said you had 200 members. Do, is that, are you, are you happy with that? Do you want more members? And do you know, like how does certification play into this too? Like, 
because um, we know that a lot of our businesses actually aren't certified by the city or the state. Correct. Uh, no, 250 is not enough. We need more members. Uh, we need just more support from the black business community. But um, on certification, we need to make sure all our members are certified. I mean, even um, marketing, uh, the city and the state uh, does marketing, uh, writing, uh, even if you're a lawyer, you know, they, they still use um, these businesses. So we advocate and we, we have a great relationship with the certification with the city and the state to get people uh, certified uh, through the city and the state. Do you think, um, so we know we had this disparity study and um, it's been, the chamber has really raised its level of activity. Do you think black businesses overall are progressing? Um, do you think in, in particularly in Indianapolis, um, I know COVID-19 took a big hit, but before that point, do you think we were on an upward trend as far as uh, businesses doing better? Or was, how would you describe basically the environment from what you were seeing? Yes, I think we were trending upward, um, but like you, you talked about, uh, data is king. Uh, so we have to have the data. And so with the city doing a disparity study, you know, we, we've been saying that, you know, that we're not getting enough as a black community. But once they did the disparity study, now we have the data to back it up. And in, in the white community, you have to have data to back up what you're claiming. Understood. And so with COVID-19, we're facing even more challenges. And so I think this is a good time to bring in uh, the Honorable Robin uh, Shackelford. Uh, Representative Shackelford, you are the leader of the Indiana Black Legislative Caucus. Uh, and following the work that you all have been doing, uh, you well, first, um, I'd like for you to talk about the environment that you're operating in. Um, but can you also tell us about the Indiana Black Legislative Caucus? So uh, our current environment, like most environments, is I'm operating from my home, which most of our legislators and most people are, we're trying to practice staying at home. But the Indiana Black Legislative Caucus is made up of the 12 uh, minority senators and reps uh, that represent the state. So we do work that will advocate on behalf of our community when it comes at the state level we're looking at those bills and policies that we think either should be in place to help advance African Americans or trying to pay, play defense on some of that legislation that's coming down that they, we think will harm our community. And one of the, the environment that you all are operating in, um, you're, you're in super, you're in, in a minority position in both chambers, yet you still have to fight and you've had some success. Correct, so uh, I'm sorry, you was talking about that environment. Yeah. Yes, we are in the super minority. So that means the Republicans, they control the House, the Senate and the governor's office. But even being in that position, we have been able to still have success in working through our agenda, especially when it comes to MBE, WBEs and VBEs. One of the pieces of legislation that we were able to get past this session was just making sure our state universities are reporting their MBE, WB numbers and VBE numbers directly to the state budget committee. We give out millions of dollars to these state institutions, but we were having issues and concerns with a lot of them not meeting their goals. So they will report their information to the Department of Administration, but we wouldn't be able to see it. We wouldn't be able to drill them when they come before the state to get their funding. So now uh, through a bill that Senator Taylor actually authored and we got past this session, those state institutions will now have to come before the budget committee and submit those uh, numbers to us. So, so that, sounds, that sounds like a major win. Um, it sounds, you know, getting the data as, as uh, Larry with the uh, Indy Black Chamber of Commerce mentioned. Um, in following the work that you all have been doing at the legislature, I know that licensing has come up a few times. And um, as a policy issue, that impacts businesses um, that particularly that are doing hair, the barbershops, the beauty shops. Um, I know you, I think you've done work on uh, diabetes and specialists in that area. Can you talk about that and those, those fights there and how that's impacted black business? 
So a lot of organizations uh, will want to get licensed. For one, it just gives credibility to their industry. And for two, it helps with funding when we go and see who's actually, and I don't want to say legitimate, but who's actually a licensed vendor, whether it has to do with beauty shops, barber shops, dentistry, real estate agents. So we're trying to make sure that if you're supposed to be licensed, then definitely make sure you are licensed by the state. I wanted to just touch on certification because this has become another important avenue that I think all of our minority businesses need to do, not only at the state level, but at the city level, and then also if you work with Midwest. These are three different entities. These entities are no longer sharing information. So mm. there's no longer a collaboration. If you get certified with the city, then you will be automatically certified with the state. So I think it's vital that uh, black businesses know that you need to get certified at all three of these entities. They're all vital institutions and they all give out contracts when it comes to minority businesses. Yeah, the Mid-State Supplier Diversity Council, this, they're kind of like the, the private sector version of what the city and the state are doing as far as holding, uh, hold, holding on to lists. Um, as a policy maker, when you're thinking about COVID-19, I know you, we, just, we just got out of session. Um, at, the, at the federal, state, and really at the local level, you being at the state level, you're kind of in the middle of the local and the federal. What are, what are things that you're hoping to see um, that are coming either from the local level or the state or the fed, state or federal level, actually, um, that will positively impact Black businesses? So I'm hoping to see that a lot of our Black businesses take the opportunity and actually get a lot of the assistance of the funding that's coming down from the state level. There is millions coming down, whether it's within the CARE Act, whether if the federal government have given agencies and nonprofits money to actually give out and assist these minority businesses. A lot of them are loans, but some of them are actually grants. And I know Black businesses have been wanting grants for years. So this is the opportunity that I say, get connected with the SBA, get connected with your lender. I know I have posted some of the issues and concerns that black businesses are having applying for these funds, but please let us know at the legislative label, legislative le uh, level, what are some of those issues and concerns because we can convey them back to the governor, which will get it back to the president and at the federal level. So, um one of the things that uh, I know that you are always preaching is that advocacy matters and advocacy works. What does it mean to see the ND Chamber at the General Assembly during session for you as a policymaker? So it means a lot. And I just want to thank the ND Black Chamber for coming down for the last couple of years and advocating on behalf of those minority businesses, you guys are doing an excellent job. We get different groups coming out to the state house daily, but we never have enough African-American groups, whether it's the Minority Health Coalition, the NAACP, the Urban League, or the Black Chamber. I firmly believe in advocacy work because you have to be in front of these legislators. You're talking about 150 legislators across the state of Indiana some of them do not get to interact with a lot of African Americans, especially professionals. So this is the opportunity to have you step in front of those legislators when we're all in the same place. And it definitely shows up in the legislation. That it is, it's certainly exacerbating a lot of the um, disparities that we already knew kind of existed. And so um, it's gonna become even more incumbent on you know, folks to engage their legislators to even advocate for some of the policies that they want to see happen. That's definitely has to be a part of the story of black businesses in COVID-19. Correct. And when you're looking at some of those disparities, whether if it's health disparities, whether if it's economic disparities, the black businesses, the black individuals are always at the top or at the bottom of the list. So it is vital that you guys voice your concerns, any issues that you're having, let us know. Uh, we are still meeting. We meet behind the scenes, whether we're meeting with leadership, whether we're meeting with the governor's office, 
but please let us know still what are those issues and concerns that are happening in your space. And that's actually an important piece of the story that maybe we don't take advantage of um, like we should. Um, do you, when's the time for folks to start engaging with legislators? So the time is now. The summertime is the perfect time to actually start talking with the legislator. If you're thinking about any legislation that you would like to see coming up next session, the summertime is the best time to get a hold of us. This is the time where we're willing to come out to where you are when we get through having to stay at home, whether it be by computer or whether it be over the phone, we can still do that. But this is the perfect time because we start drafting our legislation during the summer and then it's actually due in the fall. So I keep a running list of any issues and concerns or legislation that people are interested in for next year. And next year is a budget year. So that is the year that we will be talking about money, whether it has to do with minority businesses or majority businesses. So this is the time to actually start engaging with your legislator. And I, I appreciate the fact that the Black Legislative Caucus um, has the opportunity in as much as they are representing um, different communities across the state to advocate for the Black community across the state. I know that you all communicate with the governor. Um, are there any, um, how, how, does that, how does that usually go uh, when you all are, are communicating with the governor, particularly about issues as they pertain to the Black community? So I would say that Governor Holcomb is one of those governors that are very receptive. Uh, during session, the Black Legislative Caucus, we develop an agenda. We actually meet with all uh, four of the leaders of the legislature and go over the agenda and ask for their assistance. And included in that, we also meet with the governor and ask for his assistance. We always have MBE, WBE, VBE businesses on the agenda because they are always at the forefront of things that we're fighting for. So when we're sitting with the governor uh, talking about minority businesses, talking about any assistance that they need, he's very receptive. And I will also just throw out a kudos to the new director of the Indiana Department of Administration, Leslie Crane. She has been great to work with. She actually came from the House of Representatives, but us being able to work with her directly and get some of these issues that were uh, confronting the MBE WBE department. She has been great and effective in listening to us and changes that needed to be made. And uh, my understanding is they're doing a disparity study now too, right? Yes. So I just wanted to make sure we just had, I'm on the subcommittee for the disparity study for the state. Uh, the same company that did the cities, BBC, is also conducting ours. And right now they're in that stage where they're reaching out to businesses to take the surveys, whether it's online or by phone. So I just wanted to make sure that if you have got that invitation, if you're a small minority business, please complete the survey because this is vital to us collecting that data when it comes to proving that there is a disparity with black businesses at the state level. Data definitely matters. And so um, we've been talking about the challenges and the problems, and I think Right now, uh, what I'm going to do is transition to my co-moderator, uh, Molly, to talk about some of the solutions and some of the things that are happening within the Black ecosystem. And we'll have uh, more questions for the other panelists a little bit later on in, in the program. Molly? Thank you, Marshawn, and thank you, Representative Shackelford, and thank you, Larry. Uh, the Indianapolis Black Chamber was New America's very first partner in the city of Indianapolis, so I'm always really glad to have them here with us. Uh, so as Marshawn said, we've, we've heard a little bit about the scope of the problem, and, and a lot of us understand how this looks in the Black community. Uh, we started kind of at grass tops, uh, understanding advocacy and kind of formal structures. We're going to move now to talking about grassroots, and I'm going to welcome my guest, Imhotep Adisa, who's the co-founder and one of the leaders at the Kepra Institute. Uh, so I'm going to let my colleagues or Imhotep unmute. <laughs> Wonderful. Hey. Hi. Hello, um, Molly. How are you? I am great. Thanks for being here. I'm always glad to see you and to see the Kepra crew. Now, since we have folks from outside of the city, I'd love for you to take a minute and tell me what is Kepra? And I'm going to use this super scientific method of holding up the spelling. I don't know if you can see it. K-H-E-P-R-W. What is Kepra and what do you do? 
Pepper Institute is a nonprofit organization. Uh, we launched uh, about 18, 19 years ago, focused primarily at the time on African American males. Uh, my son, Paulette's grandson, and we just needed to have some positive cultural uh, reinforcement, and Pepper was born from there. Uh, it's been heavy from the beginning, focused on entrepreneurship as an approach to uh, building leadership and agency. Uh, and solving community problems. Uh, fast forward to the present, we uh, now are heavily involved in a variety of, of areas of what we call community wealth building. Uh, that includes uh, entrepreneurship with a heavy emphasis on addressing the needs and issues in community, uh, the environment. Uh, we're involved with a national initiative called the Climate Justice Alliance. Um, all youth Focus leadership development using an enterprise model to encourage and build and develop leaders. And there's a ton of programs that we're involved in. Today's topic, of course, is focused on the pandemic and the role of entrepreneurship uh, in this space. Kepper, KG, PRW.org. Fantastic. I, for doing a million things, you really summed that up really quickly. Well, so, you know, Mar Marshawn says, keep us succinct, man. Keep us succinct. <laughs> <laughs> you said it, I didn't. But uh, we, we have you on here. You're one of our favorite personalities in town, for sure. Oh, so well, you hit you. something really important, Matap. You, you hit on the cultural significance of entrepreneurship in the Black community. And Indianapolis is kind of home base, you know, real legacy of entrepreneurship. Uh, we even started this program before we broadened the scope, talking explicitly about uh, barbershops and beauty salons, because we know that there are certain businesses, restaurants, personal care, that have an especially strong legacy uh, in the Black community. When you think about the role of entrepreneurs in preserving Black culture, what comes to mind? Mm. Uh, well, culture itself is, wraps up everything everyone does within the context of their own cultural experience. So black and brown entrepreneurs do things differently, uh, sometimes viewed as not doing it professionally, but just as unique and often solving problems and creating solutions out of what's available and what's in front of them. So uh, I think of entrepreneurship and the black community you know, we have always have had to find ways to, to do with very little, nothing, creating opportunities out of Mr. Crisis. So uh, I don't know a time in my community where there, weren't, where there weren't entrepreneurs grinding, building, and finding solutions in all kinds of ways and still do to this day. So it strikes me as just regular stuff. Uh, of course, the pieces that most folks are seeing and aware of during the entertainment industry, where uh, where people of color is um, prominent and visible and very successful, but you know entrepreneurship, you name it, we got folks in those spaces doing work, certified, non-certified, and finding ways to to support community work and economy. So as COVID challenges all business owners and certainly entrepreneurs who are often on that razor thin margin of being able to make ends meet. Um, they, they provide a cultural, they serve a cultural need, they serve a business and an economic need. What are you doing at Kepra and what are you seeing others do to make sure that entrepreneurs stay connected right now? It would be a hard time to be out there on your own. Um, okay, the, the Kepra work in the entrepreneurial space, I would like to probably categorize it in maybe three areas. One, we uh, decided to launch our, a, a grant-based supporting fund for entrepreneurs and artists. And it's called LEAD, the Local uh, Entrepreneur and Artist Direct Support Fund. And it's on our website, lead.kepra.org. And we're encouraging the community folks to make a donation to that space. And every week, we're going to pull a lottery-based approach to whoever applies in that, in that arena, in that space. We gave our first grant out uh, last week, and we intend to provide a grant of at least $500 as long as we can continue to, to acquire funding to support that. And part of that's driven around, again, the idea in community where we've always found ways to, to support and generate dollars to support our initiatives. So that was the first thing we 
side that we could do in that space. We also uh, added a, a page to our website called pandemic.keper.org, which has a community-based resource hub. And on that page, we are highlighting various opportunities to support entrepreneurs at this time. The thing the Chamber is doing uh, with the Response Hub, it's all on our page. Other resources, uh, one specifically to entrepreneurship, but there are other categories that we've added to that page to let community folks know, here are the places that for support, whether it's in the entrepreneur space, the uh, food space, the housing space, and then also a section for uh, folks to find out what are other people doing in communities around the country that might create some, uh, some ideas for local folks to be uh, supportive of. There's a section on there, if you've got an idea, you can submit it and then we'll post and put that on this, this central page for supporting um, entrepreneurs. One, two, I think I like to mention, oh, and then Alchemy, of course, mm -hmm. which is uh, uh, for, uh, an, an entrepreneur initiative we launched right before the pandemic, uh, focused on supporting black and brown entrepreneurs at the corner of 38th and Illinois. Excuse me, we just finished a pilot project uh, for, uh, uh, with uh, collaboration with Forward Cities. It's a national uh, supporter of black and brown businesses. And of course the pandemic hit, we had to shut the space down. Uh, and so we said, well, what do we do now? And so hence you saw what, what I just mentioned and we're looking now to move more of our uh, incubator support pieces online uh, virtually until uh, we can return to some more uh, safe space. Also on that, uh, we have a couple of entrepreneurs I like to highlight uh, who have found a way to, to improve and increase their business opportunities in the midst of the crisis. One is Earthly Clean, and she's a young lady, her name is Lakaya. She runs our Urban Agriculture Growing Good in the Hood initiative for providing healthy food to the community. She has a, uh, pro a, a company where she produces um, organic cleaners. And so of course, in the midst of the crisis, her products are off the chain in sales tied to people needing clean uh, hand cleaner. You can find her, I think we're gonna put her information in the chat room. And then uh, of course, there's another uh, project that we're supporting and encouraging people to look at. And that is the revolutionary goddess gear and we'll put that in um, in the chat room also and she called the other day because she makes uh, um, mask and now that the uh, you know the government of the national uh, public health official says hey everybody should wear a mask she calls it hey what do you guys think I can do to help ramp this up and I said are you are you ready for it she said, yeah I said okay well, we'll help you by supporting and put it out there online we've been talking with her, with her more about What's the best approach to build your uh, your inventory, your process for manufacturing, uh, and of course, you know, doing five to ten masks is different from doing a thousand masks. So, so we're talking with her daily, and just trying to highlight entrepreneurs in our community who, in spite of the pandemic, said, "Okay, what is it I can do? How can I be beneficial to addressing the health challenges in our communities, but also?" Uh, uh, finding an entrepreneur opportunity in the moment. Did I cover all Town the cover piece, huh? Town halls. Town halls, thank you. We, uh, we've launched a uh, uh, weekly town hall, town hall initiative using, of course, the fancy Zoom tool like we're using here, inviting uh, folks, heavily inviting entrepreneurs who often don't get an opportunity to be highlighted to come in and tell their stories and share with how they're adapting to the, the new world we find ourselves in. And then also bringing on uh, uh, folks who are supporters of, excuse me, uh, the community, uh, particularly on that financial side right now, folks of course need to try to get at that money and, and just have a way for them to talk directly, inform that community about the needs of our community and then uh, encourage them to figure out how to make these dollars uh, more accessible to folks who are often uh, the barriers of uh, qualifying are in the way. So that's what we've been doing recently. 
Is that it? No, <laughs> that was amazing. And I think I hear Aguila back there. I think you've got some of your your solid advisors, your trusty advisors on your elbow. Um, hey, I, you know, like, that's the crew. <laughs> exactly. A great person never works alone, right? Uh, so no, right. you highlighted some really important themes, and among them is the idea that while this is a tragic, awful, challenging moment nationally, uh, not to be glib, it can be tragic and challenging for the Black community a lot of the time in this country. And so people have found a way and they've they've remained really hardworking and looked for innovative solutions. So I'm hearing a little bit about not just helping the black community, but also looking to the black community for lessons and models and exemplars. And, and I really appreciate that Kepra lifts those folks up. Um, but to pivot to, to a question, you have a captive audience here of funders, of business leaders, of entrepreneurs, of folks in the social sector, what is one thing you want them to do to help Kepra keep connecting to kind of the smallest but important entrepreneurs in the city? Um, well, when we think of, that's a great question. Of course, money is always uh, a king, especially right now since we're in the midst of a severe liquidity crunch called absence of cash. Uh, I wanna start backwards by saying Wealth is broader than money. So you have social capital, and I argue social capital is the most important resource you can have in the world. Because if you have great relationships with other human beings, uh, black, white, red, yellow, et cetera, then you've got access to financial capital, uh, intellectual capital. And you know, intellectual capital is also a critical resource to have. This, this particular forum here, I would call a community wealth building forum because we're providing information to the community that will then allow other folks in community to, to access those resources. So intellectual capital, social capital, and of course cultural capitals are all critical aspects of, in, and then last but not least, uh, financial capital. All these are critical pieces of having a, e a community ecosystem that supports community wealth building. Uh, I think that would visit our website. I would say, you know, not to paint a, a dark picture, but this particular place we find ourselves, uh, yesterday is not coming back. And we are only beginning to see the beginning of uh, this storm that uh, a lot of businesses are not gonna return from. A lot of entrepreneurs, you know, it's a wrap. There's probably a ton of them already uh, gone and will not return. But in that, I think entrepreneurs should be looking at but startups should be saying, okay, what's the new paradigm that's coming out of the ground and where can I fit into that? Existing entre entrepreneurs should be taking a real critical look at what we're doing now. Is it what I should be doing in the future? Is this a moment opportunity to redirect uh, my resources, my skill sets, or what's gonna come out of the ground? We all remember CDs. We all remember DVDs. We all remember Blockbuster. And uh, those things have come and gone, but folks who were involved in those spaces uh, often had to adapt and change how they move through the world for the new world they're seeing. Lastly, in that space, I would say, you know, whenever there's a crisis, particularly of this nature, uh, human beings find a way to, to become more social and human and civil with each other. We come together, so oh my, what, what can we do? Katrina is an example of that. And so, it's a critical, healthy place to find ourselves because we can now try attempt to rebuild our relationships and community, our relationships with each other. And out of that, uh, an opportunity to try to really address this racial wealth question by looking at what do we do differently in this moment? Because this moment calls for doing it differently and changing it. Now it's risky because the other side of that in crisis is the double down. And okay, well, we, you, you see it taking place in our communities right now. People are hoarding items from the store, et cetera. So you got two, two opportunities here. I'm hoping there'll be enough of us in the midst of this, this moment to embrace the high road and look at how can we address the issues of racial uh, wealth, equity issues, and structural barriers that uh, st will still stand in our way and we'll continue to stand our way, but we do have a moment, an opportunity here to work together and figure out how to make the world a better place. 
I, I can't think of a better way to, to thank you for your time. We'll be back with some questions, Imhotep, but I'm actually going to use this as an opportunity. You set me up to swing over to Taylor because you talked about an issue. I'm going to come to Taylor Simpson here, co-founder of an important new institution and app here in town, the Halo app. And we'll hear about that a little more in a minute. But, you know, Taylor, Imhotep talked about kind of a, a liquidity, a, a flow crisis right now for resources and cash um, for businesses and for individuals. So could you tell us a little bit more about what the environment is like for capital flow and, and liquid assets right now, and then also a little bit about what Halo app does. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's tough. It's tough. And, uh, you know, kind of like we've discussed before uh, with Robin, there's resources available. My biggest concern is kind of the education to get to those resources. You know, how available is that education for Black business owners? uh black people to get to those resources and at what hierarchy are those resources going to be distributed uh, so that's that's the kind of answer to your first question us personally this is sort of our sweet spot uh, this is what we're excited about we're excited to help people during this time there's no everyone's pretty aware that a majority of the country do not does not have the resources to cover emergencies even at 500 dollars um, I myself have had my own individual personal financial crisis and the reason that usually resonates is because we've all been there and herein lies one of the, at least in my lifetime, the biggest potential financial crisis in American history and unfortunately that's going to affect disproportionately black and brown people uh, the most. So what we've created is a private peer lending community that connects people uh, real people, real lives to uh, to loans, one hundred to a thousand dollars. We're excited about it just because we're able to help people during this time. When we go through crisis like this, we have two sides of the market in any crisis. There are going to be people who have and people who need, and I believe we serve in a sweet spot of connecting the two individuals. Uh, we're excited about the opportunity here. I'm also extremely scared. I'm very fearful because this is a great opportunity for predatory services as well. And unfortunately, millions of dollars are being distributed every single week in this city alone in predatory, lo in predatory loans. So there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be helped today. But the worst thing we can do, I think, is help someone today and displace them for generations. And that's exactly what predatory lending does. Uh, and I think that's why uh, the Halo app is going to be such a shining star right now. Something that we're doing, uh, we released an article about it on Wednesday of last week is we're going to do a million dollars in zero fee loans to people in need, people that are affected by COVID-19 here in the city. We're also looking to partner. This is a great room for that conversation with individuals on the other side to uh, do those loans at zero interest or zero backer fees on our behalf. Very different from probably the proposals that people in this city are getting right now. Uh, and I think we can be extremely helpful during this time of crisis. That sounds like an incredible product and born out of a, a really sticky issue. You know, historically, there's not been a lot of trust between the black community and financial institutions, which makes sense. Racist practices and redlining and lack of access. Uh, at New America, we did a study on the racialized costs of banking that show that in black neighborhoods, people are paying 17 to $19 more for a simple checking account. So you are a rising to an occasion for sure. What is your advice for people trying to launch something like yours that's, that has to build trust and credibility? How do businesses build trust and credibility with black users right now in a time of crisis? Honest, honest, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a two-way street, you know, for me, Everything about us is very transparent. We're incredibly honest. I think the lack of transparency is what builds that distrust between people and banks. We're dealing with systems that have not changed for forever, for centuries, you know, since my grandparents have been alive. And those are the same pillars and infrastructures that are around today. So that says something, you know. Um, so I think the first thing we do is we, we're transparent, we're honest in everything that we do. Uh, and I think if, if people feel that, if it's genuine, if people can believe that from you, you know, it will resonate and, and, and transition to them as users. So, I mean, that's something that we stand for. That's something we're very proud about. 
I've never, you know, I, I've dealt with a lot of financial institutions in my life and I've, I've felt, you know, discriminated. And, and that's something that doesn't feel good. You know, you feel lesser than you walk into an institution and you know that you're not getting the same deals as others. Um, and that's something that we, you know, we don't want to continue on our platform. We want to provide people fair access. We want to give people safe access to loans when they need it because they should have it. There shouldn't be such a wide gap. And Imhotep, Imhotep you said that a little bit in, in, in your segment is just, there's such a large discrepancy between the services that some people get and the service that other people get. How can we close that gap? Uh, and I believe that's, that's exactly what we're doing here at, at the Halo app. It seems to me that, that the Halo app, that going to the Indie Black Chamber's Friday lunches, that approaching um, Kepra to go to one of their programs to calling your representative, like calling Representative Shackelford, these are good ways to get an idea of whether or not the offer you're being presented is a good idea. Um, if anyone in the chat has some ideas about where to check the validity of, of financial offers that are coming your way, that would be great how to self-advocate and protect yourself. But Taylor, what would you say to, to residents and to business owners alike? How do you kind of stop and take a breath about whether or not the money you have access to is, is good money, <laughs> is a good choice or not? Yeah, for, for me, I love that question because a big part of what we do is the psychology of it all, right? I mean, for me, even in my personal financial crisis, if somebody had just told me to relax, to breathe, to take a deep breath, everything's gonna be okay, give you that sigh of relief, you would make better choices, but you end up panicking. And this is a time when a lot of people in this city are panicking. And so the, you know, the, the first thing that, our first reflex is to, to go to a predatory service or, or you know, to, to bypass terms or fair terms and just get access to what we need to, so we can get essentials. Um, so I, I think the first thing is to make public that there are resources out there, not only the Halo app, but there's tons of resources in this conversation right now that can really help people make sure that these conversations are public, make sure that educational resources are there first. If we can provide educational resources, if we can provide emotional resources, we can even bypass some of the financial resources that people need. Um, and so I think that's, that's just my biggest concern, right? Where is that access to education for people? Where is that access that people understand that there are resources that are available and how can we as leaders uh, make sure that that's readily available for, for people? Fantastic. Before I, I pivot here, I do want to ask before we let you go for a minute, and we'll be back for questions. Uh, where can we hear more from you? Because I heard a rumor that you're going to be uh, broadcast tonight as well. We're everywhere. We're trying to be everywhere. <laughs> but uh, the thehaloapp.com, the Halo app pretty much everywhere on social platforms, on our websites, thehaloapp.com. We're going to be very active uh, or very visible in the community, especially right now. Like I said before, this is our moment. The time is now. This is absolutely where the Halo app is going to shine. Um, and so we're going to be extremely visible and we're trying to get this in as many people's hands as possible. This is a resource that people need right now. We're on the calls. We're on the front lines of people with crisis every single day. We hear their stories. We hear how they're affected. I always like to say one of the first things that I heard, uh, you know, when COVID started to, to get big was, hey, make sure you don't use public transportation. If that does not, you know, show the mindset of this country, I don't know what does. Just, I mean, atrocious that some people have no other option but to use public transportation in some of these things. So, you know, for me, we're here, we're ready to help, we're excited to help. We have uh, the backing of, of, of major people in the city. And, you know, I think if we can get people's hands on the Halo app versus some of these predatory services, we can not only save today, but we can really, 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 really save tomorrow um, for, for all of these people. Wonderful. Thank you, Taylor. Uh, so Taylor and, and Dimitev have covered some of the solutions, but we have a, a really established solutions provider with us today. I'm going to hand back to Marshawn, who's going to interview a representative from the Indy Chamber and, and tell us a little bit more about Vincent and his work. Marshawn? Thank you, Molly. And so we've heard from uh, a startup, a black startup, a social enterprise, policymakers, another uh, black, more traditional firm in our black chamber. And that's a, kind of a piece of the ecosystem. But another piece of the ecosystem and, and supporting just businesses in general is would be in Indianapolis, the Indy Chamber. And so with us, we have uh, Vincent, 
um, who actually works with Develop Indie, and we know that there's Develop Indie and Indie Chamber. Can you talk a little bit about like the lands the landscape a little bit on these economic development kind of things that are out here in the larger ecosystem, just so that we can have kind of a, a, a quick snapshot of what we're dealing with. Absolutely. So yeah, I usually have to explain this um, every time somebody uh, asks that, and I say I work at the Indie Chamber or Develop Indie, but uh, so the Indie Chamber basically is the uh, Chamber of Commerce for the Indianapolis region. Uh, we focus uh, regional uh, economic development. Um, so that is Marion County and then the eight surrounding donut counties as well. Um, and we basically just serve as a liaison for the business community for advocacy um, to, you know, progress um, progress throughout the, the region, um, improvement, and then quality of life. Um, about seven years ago, uh, the chamber decided uh, to get more involved with economic development because it just aligns with, like I said, quality of life um, and improvement, mm -hmm. just the region as a whole. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, with that, three economic development organizations merge with the chamber. Um, that will consist of um, Business Entrepreneurship Services, BOI, which works on small businesses and entrepreneurship. Um, and we have our ND Partnership, which is a regional um, economic development team um, and focuses on, you know, business attraction um, at a regional level um, and then, you know, regional uh, planning as well. And then um, you have Develop Indy, which is the Marion County in the city of Indianapolis's um, economic development arm. So we focus on business attraction, expansion, retention projects, as well as uh, real, estate pro uh, real estate development projects as well. I um, mean, work very closely on the city for any incentives that um, companies um, may qualify for. So um, I've been here for about a year and a half now, uh, really enjoy it. Um, and we have great relationships again with the mayor's office uh, Department of Met Met Metropolitan Development um, as well. Um, we work very closely uh, with the city um, on many different projects. Great. And so um, we're going to talk about a number of the programs that you all have moving forward. Um, but what I wanted to do, initially we were looking at, you know, beauty shops and barber shops, and we realized that there's a bunch of different kinds of businesses that are out here. What kind of businesses are you seeing? engage with the indie chamber right now in some of your programs like you know talk talk about you know what's the spectrum um who do you want to see that you're not seeing talk a little bit about that absolutely so we have a, a broad spectrum of different businesses that we touch uh, i know from develop indie standpoint we deal with a lot of um bigger corporations more sophisticated companies that's having large um, economic development or capital investment projects um, but with that, we also have, our, like I said, BOI, who deals with entrepreneurships and small businesses. Um, and we're touching, you know, restaurants, um, beauty supplies, a lot of service uh, providers, um, company providers as well. Um, so we really have um, an ecosystem um, established at the chamber where we could touch a uh, company basically from an inception or an idea uh, with our free business coaching products. Um, and then be able to help them grow and facilitate um, long term and um, grow to a mid size to even a large corporation um, company with any incentives that you know the uh, city may offer. So um, it, it's, it's great, great to see. It's great to be a part of. Um, we have, um, I know our business, um, our BOI team uh, and business coaching. Um, most of their clientele is, uh, you know, 50% majority of black or brown um, businesses as well. So um, we're, we're definitely focused on that. Our Hispanic business council is very large um, as well. So we're touching companies um, pretty much across the spectrum, um, startup um, all the way to, uh, you know, C corp corporation. So um, being able to have that landscape and be able to foster that networking as a chamber um, is pretty beneficial. So the beauty shops, the barber salon, the, the barbers, um, the barber shops, the beauty salons, the the restaurants. Uh, it seems like you're you're seeing everybody. The like realtors, are you seeing them? Are you seeing maybe folks that have? They're just they they are the business. Yeah, real, realtors, secu security companies, kind of what you know what Larry has uh, alluded to. Um, you know, uh, financial uh, advisors as well, which is they're just the 1099 employees that. Most okay. Of they're doing on their own um so sole proprietors llc's um we pretty much touch every different business aspect um across the you know the city um and uh, we have a lot of different members 
Um, but we also have a lot of services, you know, that are free for just for the community. And you don't have okay. to be a member to be a part of um, our business coaching is free. Um, things that we do at Develop Indie, where we look at projects for any centers that they qualify is free because we're a conscious, we're a partnership with the city and the mayor's office. So we want to help foster those relationships. So um, more than just being a membership organization, we have a lot of resources as well that's available for the community. And now you're the quarterback, uh, from what I have to understand, for a lot of these interesting programs that you're doing that can benefit black businesses, uh, particularly on the access to capital side. So can you talk about those and um, what you're seeing in that situation? Absolutely. So I uh, wouldn't say quarterback definitely takes a team, but I'm just glad to be a part of it. Uh, so um, due to COVID-19, um, um, the Indy Chamber decided to launch our uh, rapid response hub. Um, basically, it started out as a resource for businesses to come come to check out free for anybody to, to, to view. Um, and on this hub, we have uh, frequently asked questions um, that companies um, may ask as far as everything from federal uh, programs to local programs and state programs. Every time, you know, the governor made another announcement about, you know, the stay at home orders, uh, we've seen a flood of questions come in. So outside of just to frequently ask questions, we also had a avenue where businesses can ask detailed questions um, and they will get responses very quickly from people on our team or we would connect them with the IU uh, Kelly School of Business, which was doing um, answering questions pro bono for all companies um, as well. Um, in addition to that, um, with the city of Indianapolis and other investors as well, we raised a lot of capital to um, issue uh, rapid response loans. Um, so with that, uh, businesses are able to apply for up to 5,000, um, up to $25,000, um, and capital basically to stay solvent for the next, you know, um, 90 days is what we've been, what we've been telling people. And, you know, most small businesses, um, is what it affects the most. Um, and most small businesses are pretty, um, they have cash flow for probably about, uh, 15 to 27 days. So, um, this, we knew small businesses was going to be impacted the most. Um, and we wanted to be there for them, not only just have the house, um, resources, so we could be a one-stop shop to get all their questions answered, but to also give them um, access to capital. So um, with that, uh, I think we raised, uh, we set a pretty lofty goal of uh, deploying up to $10 million um, in loan. Um, we've had over 500 inquiries of different companies that have small businesses that have inquired about it, um, about loans as well. And we're working through that process. Um, and we pretty much expedited our lending process to try to get these loans out quickly and efficiently um, to all businesses that um, acquired about it. And that's going to be proactive um, in, in making sure, you know, they give us the documentations that they need. Um, and then those are, like I said, a lot of small businesses um, predominantly that are in, like I said, our black communities here in Indianapolis as well that have uh, reached out as, um, along with that. And we're seeing a lot of restaurants, um, like I said, uh, beauty salons as well, barbershops, um, but service, um, a lot of service companies. I know Marshawn, uh, you wrote an article last week in the recorder about how um, service industries would be affected the most and more importantly, you know, uh, the black workers that work in service industries. But um, to that point, um, a lot of service industries have reached out to us uh, to in the process to get those loans. Um, and all the way from like uh, security companies as well, uh, a lot of just, service oriented companies outside of just food and restaurants, which we have many of those as well, have uh, reached out to try to stay solvent during these times. Well, it sounds like a lot of the areas where black businesses are kind of situated within the Indianapolis market, um, those types of businesses are taking advantage of the resources. Do you know, do you feel like you're seeing enough black businesses do that? Would you like to see you know, what's, what's that looking like? Have y'all had a chance to kind of, you got 500 applications. Yeah, I would absolutely like to see, um, I think a lot more. I know historically our loans and our clients that we've had, that we have done lending to, like I said, have been 50% black or brown um, uh, entrepreneur. We, we would like to stay on that range with these rapid uh, response loans. Um, I have seen uh, quite a few, um, you know, black owned businesses and minority owned businesses that have applied. Um, through the um, through our rapid response loans, um, I absolutely 
would love to see more. Um, and just being knowledgeable about the resources that's out there is very important um, for, I believe, for you know, the black community as a whole. Um, and so them being aware of this and being able to take advantage, uh, I've been talking to like, a lot of different people who have reached out, knowing I work at the chamber, um, a lot of friends. I've been trying to share it on all my social media platforms, just personally, um, because I know I have a lot of friends that are entrepreneurs in the city as well. And I know they can take advantage of it and, or they could share it and it could get it a hold of, you know, somebody that could use it. Absolutely. So um, we absolutely would love to see more, um, but we still want to, you know, try to maintain that target that we've had historically with um, our other loans. So um, one of the things, so, so before we, we move to the questions, because we're starting to get the, the questions are coming in. I can see, I can see them coming in. Um, what advice would you give to both the developing black business, maybe one that is newer in their in their cycle, uh, and the sophisticated black business? Indianapolis Recorder's been around for 125 years. I, I don't, you know, uh, we have other businesses like uh, Indianapolis Recorder that you know are are out here. Um, what advice would you give them about, you know, the programs that you all are? You're, you're using particularly your loan programs and, and that kind of thing. Absolutely. So any, any loan process can be pretty daunting for um, a lot of small businesses. Um, mm -hmm. So with that, um, there is documentation that needs to be uh, included uh, with any type of business loan. Um, we also require people to be certified with the state. Um, and not only uh, with the state, you know, um, being certified locally at a city level um, with our Office of uh, Minority and Women in Business Development um, will go a long way as well. That's not necessarily needed for a loan, but you do need to be uh, registered um, with the state. Um, with that, having a business bank account um, and not commingling your personal funds with your business funds and setting up a draw um, for you to have, um, uh, you know, keeping accurate bookkeeping from your business statements, your, your profit and loss statements. Um, those are things that we ask for as well, just to show cash flow of the business. Um, so those are kind of the things that I would um, encourage uh, developing companies to do. As far as uh, sophisticated companies, is just continue to be knowledgeable of all the resources that are available. Um, with that, your first port of contact is probably be the bank that you already have a relationship with and reaching out to them because they will be uh, way more knowledgeable about all the different type of programs that you could possibly uh, qualify for. Um, and then taking advantage of, um, you know, low interest rates at this time um, and refinancing different aspects um, if you can. Um, but again, you're just staying knowledgeable, knowing all your resources that's out there, um, and then just continue to be uh, an, an advocate for other uh, minority uh, businesses as you go forward and move through the process. And just one, one quick point of clarification. You mentioned certification, and you were talking about within the context of white businesses. I know that I know there's there's the city and the state certification. What you're saying, um, you know, is not necessary for the loans. Did you mean the Secretary of State's office, like being being certified or, or recognized as a corporate entity with sec? Yeah, yeah, being recognized. A, yeah, being recognized as a corporate entity with the Secretary of State's office um, okay. is, is required is required for a loan. Um, that's not. Yeah, it would just be an add and a plus um, if you're, you know, registered with the city and certified through, you know, um, the city as well. So, uh, but being registered with the state as a business organization, a secretary of state as a business organization um, is required. And that's as simple as just filing with the secretary of state's office and developing your articles of incorporation and deciding, you know, are you an LLC, S Corp, that kind of thing. Okay. Exactly. Awesome. Yes, sir. Yep. So with that, with that um, we have a bunch of questions, and I'd like to kind of reconnect with uh, my my co-moderator here. I have some questions. Look like you you probably have some questions. I'll let you go first. Sounds good. We'll we'll divvy it up. Um, I think my first question is, I'm going to pivot to Larry, uh, and then to Representative Shackelford. Um, we've had several questions on the back channel about data. Larry, you mentioned the importance of data access to it, making a compelling case for your business. So Larry, let me start with you. Um, where do you send your members to get good data on business, on the community? Where's, what's your source? Well, we, we have a uh, Dr. Shola um, on our uh, board who does all our data. So we, 
we keep a lot of the data. He he prepares the data for us. Um, that that's what's so important. And as we talk about data, um, I want to make sure that um, as the businesses grow um, and they're going through this COVID nineteen, they should also write down their losses. We we write down what, what we're getting, but we also had to write down our losses. So whatever contracts that we're supposed to have, you know, you need to document that because next year, um, you know, we don't know what's going to happen, but, you know, tax time comes, they're going to ask, you know, how much did you lose during this time? You got to have that documented. Uh, again, that's the data you got to have uh, to receive some more funding. Thank you so much. And Representative Shackelford, you talked a little bit about data systems and data systems that don't connect. Um, what data systems would you like to see be improved or changed to better serve black business, especially after some of the disparities that the COVID crisis have exposed? So I would like to see for there to be a one-stop shop for a lot of these black companies to be able to fill out information, whether it has to do with getting a loan or accessing government resources. I know someone had mentioned in the comments that they needed more information like direct on how to actually apply for some of these loans and grants uh, through the CARE Act. But I wanna let black businesses know that there are actually attorneys doing pro bono work. They will guide you through the process. They're doing presentations. So I'll be happy to get some of that information to you and Marshawn. And that may be uh, the next, um, I don't know what you're calling these things right here, <laughs> electronic town hall that you're doing but uh, I have uh, set in on some of those presentations because this information can be very complicated to get through. You will need the help of an attorney or a CPA if you really wanna do it correctly, but there are uh, CPAs and attorneys actually out there offering free work and that will help you with the application process. But if we can get any of these applications streamlined, I know we're trying to do that at the state but since there is a lot of resources out there, I would love to see some of these things streamlined so people don't have to keep going to every different source and completing the same information over and over. Excellent. Um, so we'll get that information from you and then any of the panelists and also folks in chat. If you know of people who are doing pro bono work, if you know of folks who can help navigate some of these bureaucratic systems, um, I, see, I see Larry <laughs> making a motion. That would be great, Larry. Yes, um, the Black Chamber, that's what we're doing. We're helping our members um, go through these loans and, and these grants that we have access to. So um, we are here to help people um, maneuver through uh, because a lot of them don't have the uh, right information. So we're helping people build up the information they need uh, to get these loans and grants. Great, thank you, Larry. Marshawn, I'm gonna pivot back to you for some more questions from the, the back channel. So uh, first, it's good to hear um, that Larry, our Indie Black Chamber, is, is already on the job trying to help our businesses navigate through this. Um, but I'm actually going to go to Vincent. And my question for Vincent, and you, you may not have the answer to this. Um, one of the questions that came up was, um, you know, why a loan versus a grant? And um, I guess the other question that I would add to that is, can you talk about, like, some of the terms the, some of the financials on, on, on the grants, that, or the loans rather, that you are doing. Absolutely, yeah, so I definitely wanna mention uh, to, to the last question, um, you know, the response hub has kind of been a one-stop shop for resources. Um, we, we have our own loans, but so does every other bank. So um, unfortunately, it's, it's not one just to do everything, but I know the Indy Bar Association is doing pro bono work as well, um, and we can connect you through our response hub um, um, for that. Um, as far as uh, loans um, compared to um, grants, um, it, it is considered a loan, um, but the terms of it is very favorable. Um, so we're looking at 3.75% interest, interest rates, uh, which are very good um, from a business standpoint, um, and even personally, um, just overall. So um, the loans are, are not meant to be, uh, to take advantage of anybody. Um, and then even with that, uh, no interest should be accrued uh, until the middle, of, like, around 90 days, about the middle of the summer is what we're telling people. And that's when first payments are, are, are due as well. Uh, with that, we're really just using our loan um, access um, kind of as a gap filler uh, for most companies. 
um, if they are still submitting through the SBA, which is a longer in-depth process, uh, once they get paid by the SBA, they can pay off um, our loan and it's forgivable. There's no penalties um, at all. Um, so that's not the case for a, a lot of other, um, you know, uh, entities that are, are administering loans. But um, for our process, is really just to be there for the companies just to remain solvent. Um, like I said, interest rates are very low um, and payments are, and interest are not beginning to accrue or be due um, into the middle of the summer. So um, that's kind of our process uh, that we have. Um, and I know there are some grants out there. Um, LISC announced one as well with a, a partnership with uh, Verizon. Um, my, my, my mom uh, personally has an in-home daycare, uh, which my sister works for as well. Um, they applied for some grants because they had to close down um, as for a few weeks. Um, so they applied through some grants as well. Uh, so I know CICF may be doing some things uh, as well as United Way. So um, the Response Hub should have uh, most of that information about grants that um, are on there as well. Right. So I, I, I was aware of the LISC grant with um, Verizon, which was a business grant. Yeah. And then my, also my understanding is with the Small Business Administration, their grants are for their loans rather are forgivable um, or some portion of it is forgivable if you have if you maintain your employees mm -hmm. had you had you can you talk a little bit about that i know you're not the sba but uh, yeah no I, I do i do not know the exact exact answer to that question uh, okay and okay. That's, that's probably the first time i've heard that um that's not necessarily the case for our the loans that we are administering through um, our business uh, entrepreneurs services but okay. um, yeah so it, it was a little bit different from the sba but we do follow some SBA, most sba guidelines as well and then i know it, it, Hotep, you wanted to say something i think you have you have a grant yeah. program go ahead well yeah i was not about that but yes we have a grant program lottery based i think we shared that earlier uh, send folks over for that but I know United Way is doing a webinar tomorrow specifically on this, how does payroll piece work? So you might check that out. Um, also, Marshawn, along along with that, um, I, I have to mention this, even though it's not, not related to um, COVID, um, kind of with Kepra um, and they're, you know, partnering with Forest Cities, um, we do have a loan um, program um, that has uh, capacity in it, I believe up to $60,000. For entrepreneurs that are in the target areas for four cities that are at zero percent interest um, and they can go for loans from a hundred all the way up to ten thousand uh, dollars for entrepreneurs that are targeted in those areas um, and we absolutely want you know black businesses and that's who is it, it's geared for um, the black community and small entrepreneurs to, to you know take advantage of that um, so that is a revolving fund um, once it's out in the next, uh, you know, installment, we'll, we'll go through. But uh, just to be aware of that, um, with a partnership with, you know, four cities, we do have that um, program as well. I had one more question for Representative Shackelford. Um, and if others have some thoughts, I'd like to hear from them as well. But Representative Shackelford, one of the questions we got was, you know, post COVID-19, um, this this can't this too shall pass. What should black businesses be thinking about? What should we be trying to to do as we prepare for a post COVID nineteen reality? What are some things that you think from a, maybe at the policy level? If some of you all have some ideas, maybe as entrepreneurs, um, what what's post COVID nineteen for black business from your perspective? So from my perspective, and as far as policy, I would say for some of those businesses, if you have to close your business because you're just losing so much revenue in this state, then think about some of those other things that you may want to get engaged in. I know entrepreneurs are those type of people that if one business closed and they're still thinking about what other things can I do? So this is that time to start thinking about is there another business that I would like to get into uh, that I can actually make more money when it comes to whether dealing with COVID-19 or any other type of business uh, to look into? And then think about it policy related licensing. What kind of licenses do I need to get into? Is there policies that 
are creating challenges or barriers that I would like to see change. So just think about those things as we start going into the fall and going into next year when session is going about to start and you want to engage some of those legislators and talk about ideas that you may have to help come out of this crisis. All right. Yeah, entrepreneurs, any, anybody else? Um, I know one of the things that people have been talking about is the challenge of business interruption insurance and whether or not um, COVID-19 or a pandemic is covered uh, within that. And I know the state, you know, they regulate insurance policies and things of that nature. Um, any other things that we should be thinking about as a black business community post COVID-19? And it, Marshawn, if I could just add one thing, I'm also a travel agent. So I know the travel industry has been hit hard. Uh, I've received numerous calls from some of my clients wanting to cancel some of their trips. Some of the uh, vendors I will say are doing a good job at getting people's money back and some of them are not. So the travel industry, I know we have a lot of um, blacks that actually do travel and that are facing some of these challenges. So I think going into next legislation year, especially when you said insurance, that just made me think about it because you have some companies that are reimbursing the insurance component and some companies that are not. So people are frustrated that they may have to get a credit just for that insurance portion and they can get back some of their money uh, when it comes to whether they took a cruise or paying at a hotel. So I think those are some of those things and challenges that a lot of African Americans will probably bring up and have issues with of how insurance was handled, what was actually covered by insurance, were they able to get their money back? But I know I'm seeing a lot of that take place in the travel industry. Great. One, uh, one more breaking news kind of situation is um, uh, I, I happen to know that Representative uh, Shackelford made a request for some data from a particular agency uh, just yesterday. We found out we're going to be getting that data on Thursday. Um, what other kind of business data? And this, the data that Representative Shackelford requested had to do with race data on health disparities as it pertains to COVID-19. I just got a message that we're going to get that data on this Thursday uh, from the State Department of Health. What other data do you think um, we need to know as a business community? Uh, I'm thinking about, you know, the banks are about to provide uh, funding to use our tax dollars to provide uh, funding to their clients. Should we have some data on that? Those are kind of things I'm thinking about. What other kind of data? Most definitely. I would want to see the data of all this assistance that the government is sending out and who actually received it, which businesses actually got it, and what did they use it for? Because I can tell you right now, I can foresee another disparity when it comes to the resources that was sent out, whether it was loans, grants. So that data is also vital. Uh, I know the Black Caucus will also be requesting some of that data be made public. All right, um, I'll, I'll turn it back. Well, did anyone else have, Larry? Yes, um, we, I mean, we, we've uh, learned from these loans that they have, um, like even I put in a loan for a, a bankable and they wouldn't accept my loan because they said they wanted to see what the SBA was gonna give me. Well, the SBA right now, the PPP loan, um, they crashed yesterday. The SBA crashed. They had to come up with a different uh, application. So um, I know everybody's sending everybody to the SBA, but I mean, the SBA really is, you know, barely moving now. They, they don't even know what they're doing, to be honest. Um, so uh, there, there is some, you know, people saying that they're here to help. But they are, but not everybody is helping. I mean, you know, there's applications being denied. Um, they also are asking, um, you know, uh, do you have a criminal background? You know, these these are things that people don't know that's happening in the background. That if you got a criminal background the last year, they're not going to give you a loan. So if you, if you just came out of prison and you started your own business and you're doing great, and now you're hit by this. You know, now you, you're not qualified for the SBA loan. So, I mean, there, there's a lot of disparities that's going on here that we got to keep track of. I, I appreciate that insight. I, I, 
Go ahead, Em. You gotta unmute yourself. Did you unmute? Yeah, there okay, you go. Okay, I got it. Um, yeah, I think I just want to add in addition to the to data, it would be good for us to take a a look back to previous times when there have been uh, economic challenges and crisis. 2008, uh, the, the Great Depression, and what are the similarities and what are the differences between those particular uh, moments and the present? And I think those kinds of uh, exercises could help better inform our direction and approach to uh, post-pandemic, a post-pandemic world. Learning from the past to, to help us move forward. Uh, Molly, did you have any other questions that you? Yeah, so I wanted to highlight a, another question before we, we wrap up here. And that was a question about, you know, this is a new normal for businesses. As, as you have said, we're not going back to the way it was. And so the future is digital commerce. The future is um, changing even the ways those who provide hands-on services schedule or take payment. Um, there may need to make some physical or infrastructure challenges. So when you think about um, the assistance that business leaders are going to need, um, Vincent, I saw you nodding, so I'm going to pick on you first. Um, are you familiar with anyone who's lending assistance to Black businesses to help them turn to e-commerce, to help them change their physical surroundings so that they can adapt to the new normal? Um, I'm, I'm not aware of any uh, particular uh, entity that is doing that. Um, I, I was not in my head because it actually uh, has been kind of inspiring to see how uh, some uh, businesses um, and even uh, black businesses have been able to pivot to a more um, online platform. I know Kepra, uh, I believe just a couple weeks ago, had a, a lady that has a, a yoga studio that started doing um, virtual classes. So, and uh, along with that, there was a musician on there that, you know, he's now, he's doing little clips, personal clips for people that are, are sending them money to do uh, do things like that. So it has been interesting and exciting uh, to see how um, companies have been a little innovative um, and being able to move the platform. And then at the end of it, it's just gonna make companies even stronger once they have like, still do the in-person things and it would be able to be virtual as well. So uh, I wish I was aware of another entity um, that was able to help out with that. Um, we don't have really anybody um, housed at the chamber that focuses on that. Um, but um, I, I think it is a necessary for a lot of businesses to be able to learn and be innovative and to be able to pivot. Excellent. Um, Imhotep, did you want to add something to that since uh, Kepper came up as an example where people are being uh, creative? Yeah, um, well, of course, our work, we have a lot of young adults, a lot of young folks grew up with technology. They do technology up, down, left, or right. I got three of them here uh, <laughs> in our dormitory uh, that, that if I need something technologically wise, these guys get at it. Uh, Rasul uh, is leading up an initiative we're working with New America on called Democratizing Our Data. And we are training uh, young people in those fancy data analysis tools like Python and R, et cetera. Uh, we uh, also have a one of our enterprises, KI New Media, and we're now actually looking at how do we take those skills that we've acquired and make those skills available to entrepreneurs who need to, to have more of a digital format and become more involved in, in that space. Uh, with, the, with Alchemy, our incubator, we're moving online. We envision having uh, classes and workshops to assist in that kind of space, but Somebody's out there listening now, get at us. We'd be more than willing to, uh, to provide some free consultation and to figure out how we can um, help you with that, that, that narrative. Join our incubator, incubator.kepra.org and become a member of that team and we'll figure out how to do this together. Thank you. Uh, Taylor, could I, could I ask you really quickly before I hand back to Marshawn, because I think I saw you nodding. Yes. Uh, um, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, for me, I just wanted to make a, a, a quick statement because a lot, of, a lot of our conversation has been business oriented. Just a stop and look consumer facing because the more we can sustain our future customers, our current and future customers through this time, the better our spending power is going to be, you know, in the, in the future. 
So I, I really want us to take a, a healthy look at backing some of some of these people on on our platform at least and in pooling some of these dollars that we have as a community so we can support the people that are affected truly 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 affected on a very personal level by this crisis because they're in the thousands the tens of thousands the hundreds of thousands and if we can support them for these next coming months you know that's going to only you know benefit our companies as we come out of this crisis. So I do want us to recognize consumer facing, at least our, our customers and people that are affected by this crisis on a personal level. Um, and, and again, using the resources that we have, not only on this call, uh, but within our networks to really, really, really support them. Thank you, Taylor. Uh, Marshawn, would you like to say a few words before I kind of do the administrative closeout because we're getting near the end of our time? Sure. So um, we have talked a lot about the the ecosystem within uh, the Black business community. Um, we did get a chance to highlight um, some of the venture funds that are coming up. Um, Be Nimble is one of those entities that's involved in developing venture funds. But we have a policymaker, social entrepreneurs. We have uh, business owners. We have our, our Black Chamber, uh, we have the Indie Black Chamber and their engagement with the Black community. This is a story that is going to, um, it'll be about disparities, but it'll also be about Black entrepreneurs continuing to overcome. And uh, I, I want to focus and celebrate that even as we continue to fight um, the, the other disparities. And so in as much as knowledge is power, let's keep listening, let's keep learning. And with that, I'll turn it over to Molly. Thank you, Marshawn, really well put. Uh, I wanna thank all of our panelists today. Thank Vincent, Larry, Imhotep, Taylor, Representative Shackelford, and certainly thank my co-moderator, Marshawn, and thank all of you for attending. A, a couple quick follow-up items. We had a number of questions we didn't get to. We will make sure that those get answered, either in future events or directly. We'll share them with our panelists. Uh, I'll be sending a follow-up message to everyone who registered with the video, the transcript, um, some of the resources we talked about, and I hope that you will take a look at that, and I also hope that you'll share it. Uh, there are lots of people who couldn't join us today, and we think that lots could benefit from, from everything we heard from our panelists. Next week, uh, we will be doing this again, same time, 2 o'clock on Tuesday the 14th. You can look forward to an invitation, and we'll be talking about Black experiences in healthcare. Uh, whether or not people feel like they're listened to, do they have access to affordable care, uh, some of the disparities and health outcomes related to the Black community that we're seeing unfold. It's a very important conversation. We hope you'll join us. And I want to give special note to our community partners at WFYI Public Broadcasting, namely Side Effects Public Media, who is partnering in this uh, whole project and then playing a special role, an elevated role in next week's program. So we're really grateful to all of you. I hope you had a chance to engage. I hope you'll follow up with our materials and share them far and wide. On behalf of New America, thank you so much for joining us today. And I love it when I stick a landing. Look at us managing our time and ending right thank at you. 30. Uh, so please be safe, be well, and have a great day, everyone. Great day. Thanks, everybody. Thank, thank you. you.